Welcome back to another episode of Theology Applied. I am your host, Pastor Joel Webin with Right Response Ministries. And in this episode, I'm privileged to welcome to the show for the very first time, Pastor Doug Van Dorn. Pastor Doug Van Dorn is a Reformed Baptist pastor. He holds to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, just like I do. We've got a lot in common, but one of the things we have in common is not just the 1689, our Reformed theology, but our fascination, interest, some might call it an obsession, with giants and the Nephilim and fallen angels, and these kinds of high strangeness things. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about it from a covenantal perspective, a spiritual perspective, a reformed perspective. There's not a lot of guys who necessarily are within the reformed world who have these views. A lot of them tend to be dispensational. A lot of them tend to be premillennial. And Doug Van Dorn is neither of those things. So we're going to be talking about Jesus, the giant slayer slaying giants in the truest spiritual and ultimate sense and what all that means from Adam to David uh, to Christ, what that looks like for you and I today. Tune in now. Applying God's word to every aspect of life. This is Theology Applied. All right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about Heiser and and some of his conception and some of the work that you've done working off of that with you know this this divine council. Yeah. Can you explain that to our listeners? What is what's the divine council and where do we find it in scripture? Really, the main focus of his book is to talk about the divine council. Like I said, the Nephilim, the angel of the Lord. These are subtopics underneath it. So the divine council is essentially the idea that. There's a group of um, celestial heavenly beings that rule over the affairs of the cosmos. And um, if you want an analogy from Greek mythology, think about the Olympians. Now, the problem is, of course, as soon as I say mythology, people, especially in our world, they start to go crazy because they hear the word myth and they think fake fiction, lies, all this kind of stuff. And my understanding of mythology has changed dramatically. I think C.S. Lewis has been very helpful to me to to understand this. In some ways, Tolkien as well. Both these guys were just inc- incredibly steeped, well-versed in uh, a ton of mythology. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if you know it, but Tolkien gets a bunch of his names for the dwarves from the uh, Poetic Edda, in mm. the, the Scandinavian myth. So that's just kind of an example of they're they're taking these stories and they're just kind of reapplying them but but uh my my understanding of a myth is that it's really just an origin story it can be either true or false it can have over over the course of time you can have changes in it so you can have contradictions in greek mythology because they've changed the stories or they've heard them differently or whatever the case may be i mean these things are so old they go back before any any kind of written history and they're, they're a vehicle that can stand the test of time that can help people understand where their origins are from. So uh, <clears throat> that's why Heiser's original title for his book, The Unseen Realm, was actually the myth that is true. He's trying to convey the, t- the idea that the biblical story is a myth in that it's an origin story. And it's got, it's got mythological um, ways that it's working on our psyche when we read it, but it's true. It's actually history. Um, I think that probably, you know, I, I actually believe fairly strongly that Zeus was a real character and his name is actually in the Bible as either Satan or Baal, depending on the Testament that you're in. I think that those are all the same mm-hmm. entity. When somebody hears that, they, they freak out because they've been taught that, you know, mythology is false. There's nothing true about it. How could you possibly say that Zeus is real? But as soon as I say, well, he's actually Satan, he's actually Baal. Now, Baal might bother some people because they might not think he's real either. He's just an idol. Well, that's not true. But it's funny because none of our people in the reformed world would say that Satan is anything other than a real supernatural fallen entity. They understand that. So to make that connection, and I think that you can make a pretty strong biblical case, a biblical case for it, that these are all the same entity, uh, it really discombobulates a lot of people. So, yeah, the myth- mythology, things get twisted and turned. Um, but when you find certain myths, especially when you find universal myths, like, like 
every like the flood <laughs> like the flood yeah then then you're probably you know maybe some of the details you know, like take it with a grain of salt put your discernment hat on you know don't be naive but uh but if you start finding the same story um in, in every place and every time period and every like then there's probably something true there and so the idea of like giants is uh, you know it's just a universal whether it's jack and the beanstalk or you know but like giants and one element of giants that you find universally is that they're um they're typically not friendly giants you know and right. i know I, I know like a, an interpretation can be made and, and i'm partial to it with abraham you know and sure um and a couple you know but for the most part they're like uh they're man-eating giants yeah, yeah you know and then what is cyclops i mean think about that it's like okay it's just a complete made-up story or like maybe a giant that was injured and left on an island, you know, and, and only has one eye because the other one was poked at. Like, I mean, th it's entirely possible. So, anyways, yeah. So uh, the giants, you know, in, in the divine council worldview, a giant is essentially um, it's a nephilim. So that's a Genesis six, and it's a son of what are called sons of God. And in our, we'll just for sake of argument, we won't go through the this tonight, you know, arguing for why, why we would believe textually that this is the case, but I can give you one and give you a lot, but they're the sons of the sons of God and the sons of God have different titles in uh, scripture. And one of them is a watcher. You only find this word explicitly uh, or certainly in Daniel four, but when Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, um, the watchers come down of, out of heaven and say that it has been decreed upon you, Nebuchadnezzar, that you're going to live like a wild animal or whatever. That decree of the watchers is a decree from the divine council. So these these watchers, um, another people might be more comfortable just calling them fallen angels. Uh, over time, the the term angel actually became it, it changed. It morphed like just like any word really does in the in the early part of the old testament an angel is really just a messenger so it's a function by the time you get to the new testament an angel really almost becomes an ontological category it's a, you know it's a type of being so when people get upset you know with certain words that you could use for these guys i'll just say well it's a fallen angel and then that kind of takes it off the table the probably the biggest word for these guys in the hebrew is the word elohim they're called the elohim um this is a word that's used for God and it's used for the gods. And again, um, people will say, well, the gods aren't real. Uh, but if you understand that the gods are actually fallen angels, they're created entities. They're not on any kind of an ont ontological par with the uncreated creator of the universe. He made them. Right. If you can get that into your head, right. then you that's realize- That's what people have to understand. We're not talking yeah. about equals. There, not there at all. One one God who is uh, eternal, infinite, and who created ex nihilo, uh, he made these other gods. He made them all. And in fact, uh, Colossians says that Jesus is the one who made them all. And it, it got very, very specifically that he made everything in heaven and on earth. Why would it go, uh, why would it care to tell you that what he made in heaven? Hmm. Well, maybe so that you don't get confused about these guys somehow being equals with him because they're not ontologically equal with him at all. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah, so that's what, it, that's what the divine council is. This found all over the place. Um, some of the best known passages at the end of, I think it's first Kings 22. It's a really good one. This is where you have, uh, the prophet Micaiah hears, uh, the overhears or sees in a vision, this heavenly scene where, um, God is having this argument with these other heavenly beings over what they should do with King Ahab. I think it is. And he says, who's going to go and be a lying spirit? And they have a fight over it. And finally, one spirit says, I'll do it. So God says, okay, go ahead. You, you, you will succeed in doing it. What they're doing is they're having a council meeting in heaven. They're arguing about things over the earth. And then once the decision is made, then they go out and do it. And God has the final say on it. Uh, you see this in, what's another good one? Daniel chapter seven. Uh, this is where the, the really famous verse that new testament uses quite a bit that one like a son of man comes riding on the clouds of heaven to the ancient of days and he's presented a kingdom and all dominion authority is given to him well right before that you have um this it, it gives you a description of the heavenly court it talks about the throne it talks about the ancient of days it talks about a river 
being there and it talks about the thrones that are around it and the books are opened. Well, what's that? Who are on these thrones? It's the heavenly beings. It's the divine council. Hmm. We, I mean, boy, the, it, there's just a, there's just a ton of them that we could think of. Uh, actually, would you hold, the, yeah, would you hold all the way? Like another example for you, would you be uh, one of the guys who would say that like Genesis one and two in the creation narrative, um, like let us make man in our image that that's yeah. Trinitarian language or that that's divine counsel language. Are you a Christian struggling to find companies that align with your values and beliefs? Well, then Squirrely Joe's has you covered for all your coffee needs. All of their coffee is hand selected and roasted fresh every day by a family of fellow believers. Try them out and you'll savor exceptional coffee while knowing that your investment supports a company committed to following God's teachings and upholding truth and righteousness, ensuring that your hard-earned money contributes to the growth of God's kingdom. So head on over to squirrelyjoes.com forward slash right response. Enter promo code RRM at checkout for 20% off your purchase. Uh, my answer is yes to that. <laughs> okay. All right. I won't create an either or. The reason why is because uh, the Father and Son are certainly on the divine council. So, and the Holy Spirit's always present when the Son is present. So, de facto, the the Trinity is there, but it's bigger than the Trinity. If I was going to go to prove the Trinity from Genesis one, which I think you can do very easily, I'd go to the first three verses. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even make it all the way to chapter or verse twenty two or whatever that is twenty six. Mm. Um, okay. cause you have God, you have the spirit hovering and then you have God spoke the word and very clearly the new Testament tells us who that word is. Right. So, but yeah, okay. I would say that the, let us make God man in our image is the divine council having a meeting. So that's the first verse, but then the second verse, it says, and God made man in his image. So it, the way Heiser talks about it is that, uh, it's like if we all, if I said to a group of people, Hey, let's all go out for pizza. I'm speaking to a group of people, but then right. I buy. Okay, I'm the mm -hmm. one who I'm the one who does the does the work. Right. So, so talk to me a little bit about and to our listener about um, the idea. Of, so, something that fascinates me that I I would love to learn more about is the idea of regional powers. Like thinking of you know the um, it's the archangel Michael, right? It's not Gabriel. It's Michael who gets held up with the prince of Persia. No, it's actually Gabriel. Go, it's Gabriel. Oh, it's Gabriel. Gets Gabriel. Okay, so right. it's Gabriel. Um, he's like, sorry, I was I'd be here sooner, but uh, you know I had to do battle. <laughs> right. You know against you know this this power that uh, that was had a locale. It seems like an earthly right. locale, like in a particular principality. And that word principality. So there's princes and principalities. Like princes would would be spiritual beings with beings. authority, and then the principality would be like a province or a the, state yeah, the, or a region. Exactly. So so is. So my question is, when, when the fall happened, and not talking about Adam and Eve, but the 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 angelic fall, um, angels fell. They fell somewhere. They fell to earth, and it seems as though there's maybe a case to be made that they were assigned, or maybe they were already assigned by God, and then fell to their various regions, or 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 did they fall and then? A captain among them, you know, Lucifer, uh, appointed. You're going to be over Chile. You're going to be over Persia. You're, <laughs> how does how does that how does that work? This princes and principalities. Okay, so the the key text there is really Deuteronomy 32. It's that it's the paper that I talked about earlier. It's this variant. Um, and let me let me just call it up real quick so that we can read the okay. text. And so. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, we'll start in verse 7. Um, this is the song of Moses. He says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. The textual variant there says sons of Israel. Some people might have a New American Standard Bible. We'll say sons of Israel, but Dead Sea Scrolls and Septuagint say sons of God, and Heiser um, makes a very good argument that that's the original reading. The number of the sons of God there it was understand, understood throughout all the tradition as the number 70. So you can read in the Targum. Uh, Targum is a Jewish uh, paraphrase into Aramaic of the Old Testament. So some of them can be very, very strict and very close to the text. 
uh, almost like just a really good translation that we have. And then others can be more expansive. And the one of the more expansive ones in, in Gen, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy is Targum Pseudo Jonathan, and it gives the number 70 there as a good example. Hmm. Well, why is that significant? Because there were 70 nations at the Tower of Babel. So when Moses tells you to remember the days of old, he's telling you to remember Tower of Babel. Now for him, that was a long, long time ago. And Moses for us was a long, long time ago. So this is a, this is a really long time ago. But right. according to that text, anyway, and it's really the main one that we have of the, of the timing of it, the sons of God were given to the nations at the Tower of Babel. And it seems to me that it's because what happened was that, and, and I, we were talking earlier before the show about, you know, the divine incursion view of how did the Nephilim get on the earth after the flood? There's right. four or five different views out there. One is that, you know, the DNA was carried through by maybe one of Noah's sons. Another one is that it wasn't a worldwide flood. Another one is that, and so some of the giants lived through it. Another one is that um, maybe somebody like Og, the giant lived uh, by, uh, Hitching right on Noah's Ark. That's kind of a Jewish yeah, Gilgamesh yeah. hanging on to the side of the Ark and Noah's feeding him. I've exactly. seen that one. Not a, not a fan, but. <laughs> it's when you tell the kids when they're three years old, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I, I actually tend to think that your view is right, that there was another incursion. And I think that that incursion took place at the Tower of Babel. So you have to understand what hmm. the Tower of Babel was. So. And in order to understand it, you have to go back to Genesis 2 and 3. So, and then a little bit of Ezekiel can help fill in the gaps there too, because Ezekiel calls um, Eden the mountain of God. All, all we get in Genesis of Eden is that it's a garden, right? But it's a mountain. And why does that matter? Because, because Satan is there in the mountain garden of Eden tempting our parents. Well, what's he doing there? He's there because it's a divine council scene. They're on, they're consider it Mount Olympus. They're on Mount Olympus. They're making, hmm. God has, God has created our first parents to essentially have a seat on the divine council with the heavenly beings, but they get to rule over the earth. Wow. Whereas the heavenly beings are ruling over whatever, <laughs> whatever's outside the earth. However, that works. I don't have any idea. And actually, and this is the only, this is the only thing I've ever read that makes a lot of sense of why Satan tempted them. And it's because he became jealous of this. And so mm -hmm. you have whole books like the life of Adam and Eve in the pseudepigrapha that talk about that was at that moment that God made Adam and he gave him this dominion that that was actually, that was the reason why Satan fell. So that, okay, so the fall of Satan and the fall of yeah. Adam in, in this scheme would be... Very simultaneous kind of a, to one another. One, yeah, two birds, one, after one stone. The other. Yeah, uh -huh. okay. That's exactly right. So okay. Um, so the whole point being there that, that they're, on, they're in the divine council. In fact, I think you got actually have, you can make a case that there's more beings there because Satan, or, or sorry, uh, Ezekiel, I forget the chapter, maybe 31... It's the chapter of Assyria being likened to a giant tree, a world tree. And then it talks yeah. about how the, the trees of Eden were envious of you. Well, why would it use trees of Eden language? Well, that's, uh, it's kind of a metaphor for other heavenly beings. And when Adam and Eve go hiding among the trees of Eden, like what is, what's going on there? I tend to think that they're seeking refuge among the gods, if you want to call it that. Um, mm. And God gets very upset by this. <laughs> Why are you running away from me? What did I ever do to you? And then he graciously closed them with, you know, and gives them the gospel and stuff. But the point is, there's a divine council scene. It's a mountain. The, the authority is given there. And actually, even the temptation itself, believe it or not, is when you look at what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is, and you go to, say, Solomon, and he talks about how it's the duty of a king to discern good and evil. Well, what does that mean? It means that it's the king's job to make a judicial pronouncement on right and wrong. Well, that's what divine counsel does. And that's mm. the whole point of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan's temptation was incredibly subtle, and he actually tempted them with something that was very true. But the problem is that, um, well, there's a lot of problems with what happened, but of course, essentially is that they made the wrong decision, right? Um, they, they went against what God said was right. They said, Essentially, by eating it, they're they're making a judicial pronouncement 
that what God said is wrong. Right. Okay. And so then they get kick, kicked off. Now, if, if Moses is, if we just take that verse in Deuteronomy, then what happens is that the, whatever happened before the flood and how that worked its way out with, uh, you know, the fallen angels and men and authority and all, I don't have, I don't know. And I don't know that we really can know, but at Tower of Babel, it's really a, it's really a trying to get back to Eden. But instead of God putting us on his made man-made mountain, we create a mountain ourselves. It's a ziggurat. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of the thing. It's to emulate uh, what a cosmic mountain is, what a divine council mountain is. And then we go up to the top and we try to um, make communication with the fallen heavenly beings. And God said, that's not going to happen. It's not going to, it's not going to happen. I'm going to disperse you and you're not, I'm going to make your language so you can't understand each other so that you can't do this. And that's the moment it seems that Moses is saying, remember this, because that's the moment when I spread the nations out around the world that I also gave each one of those nations, one of the sons of God to rule over them. Okay. Are these fallen sons of God to rule over them or yeah, righteous? I, I think so. Uh, so there's actually a really interesting passage in the, uh, it's, I think it's in the Criteus in Plato near the end. This is, this is where actually where he writes about Atlantis and man, mm. it's so weird because he has a line that's almost exactly word for word what Moses says in Deuteronomy 32, 7. In the days of old, God gave to the nations according to their allotment. <laughs> that's what he says. And, yep. uh, and then he goes, we got as Greece, we got Athena and Hephaestus because they were the gods that were, um, given to philosophy and beautiful music and basically high culture. And of course, Plato has this idea that before the flood, it, where there was a golden age and that things were really good. And then things got worse and worse and worse over time to the point where Atlantis was destroyed because of the corruption. In some ways, that's very similar. And so I use that to answer your question, Joel, because, uh, I think, I think that the corruption of the angels got worse over time. Huh. Okay. Just like it does with humanity, even just like it does in our, in our civilization right now. The last three years are the worst right. that it's been in our civilization since the beginning of it. It's just gone right. exponentially off the charts. At Private Family Banking, our mission is to help you set up your own privatized banking system so that you can prosper and pass along tax-free wealth to the next generation and teach them to be financially responsible with that wealth. Your system will guarantee positive and continuous growth of your money, income tax protected for the rest of your life and beyond. Additionally, you will create a pool of capital that can be used to grow additional wealth using the same money in more than one place at the same time. For families, investors, and those near or already in retirement, your system will provide a buffer against market volatility to help you avoid selling off your investment portfolio during prolonged market downturns. Now, for those who are struggling with paying off high interest bearing credit cards or car loans or student loans, there's no worries. We'll teach you how to use your private family bank to accelerate the payoff of your consumer debt, including a monthly step-by-step -step guide. Turning post-mill thinking into post-mill action with private family banking. Now that's a good thing. Find out how this powerful approach to a multi-generational wealth building can work for you and your family by emailing banking at privatefamilybanking.com. You'll receive a free ebook and a link to schedule your free 30 minute consultation today. That's really interesting. I do you, th I think Plato might have, I think he might have read Moses. I, I know that it doesn't add up, but I've, I've got some people in my church who they, they're more knowledgeable than I am on the subject of, uh, you know, but like, look at, you know, it, it seems like, I don't know. It's, it seems like he had somehow had access to Moses, the, the Pentateuch. Or at least a part of it. So I, I, uh, when I was doing the Angel of the Lord book, I, uh, I found a couple of Puritans that wrote on the angel, and I started reading them. I got one of these guys' name is Peter Alex. He lived in the late seventeen seventeen hundreds. A French guy, but this dude knew. Okay. I mean, he knew every language you could know. He he read everything you could read. 
just absolute genius. And he, he says in that book that I ended up uh, kind of republishing and putting notes on it and modernizing the English and stuff for people. He says there that um, Mo- Moses knew, or sorry, Plato knew about Moses. And then he, I think he cites Justin Martyr, who basically said the same thing. So the idea seems to be that you can account for it through his ancestor, Solon, who came down to Egypt. Right. And that's where he heard the story of Atlantis from the priest there. And then it's not that he's taking a boat back to Greece. He decides to take the long way around. And of course, in order to do that, you have to go right through Israel. And Mm -hmm. so there's every reason in the world why he could have brought back um, at least the Torah. And Plato could very well have read it. Yep, that's that's I couldn't remember, but that's what I heard was. Yep. Yeah, it was through. Um, how do you say his name? Solon. Solon. Yeah. Yeah, Solon. His ancestor Solon went to Egypt. That's where he heard about Atlantis, and yeah, yeah, it's possible. <laughs> it's a wild world. Yeah. Just to think okay. About so this. yeah. So one. So we're saying fallen angels, seventy of them, and you that's think a, that it's they, a symbolic number. So, so it's not, yeah, 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 that's what, that's, yeah. So like 70 regions, 70 nations, um, and it, but it could be 500 each for each of these 70, right? Yeah, you and can maybe, have underlings that are underneath guy them. And under, Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I was, yeah. why, why would the heavenly bureaucracy be any uh, less um, complicated than earthly bureaucracy? Right. Well, maybe because they're trying to be more efficient. <laughs> 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 maybe because they want a bureaucracy that works um but yeah but yeah okay so so 70 regions nations and we would say that that still exists today we have more than 70 nations but there's there's still in in a spiritual plane w- would you agree that there's there's still a sense in which um the world would break up into those 70 different regions and there's still it's a great principi- question it's and it's, so, some of them like jude or peter may have already been locked up in gloomy dungeons but some of them may still well okay so the gloomy dungeon part is talking about before the flood uh that so if you want to think about you can think about it this way i found it helpful i don't know if it's right to do this or not but when you go to the greek myths they they have a flood and at the flood, they have uh, a, a great war between the Titans and the Olympians. The Titans are the elder gods, you know, Kronos and Rhea and these, these 12 Titans, 12, interesting number. And then the Olympians mm-hmm. with Zeus and, and uh, what's it, Hera and, and the other 12 Olympians. Again, you have that same number. And the Olympians basically lock the Titans up into Taurus. It's the exact same mm-hmm. thing. Have you seen Clash of the Titans, the remake? first i think it's the first with movie, liam maybe neeson the second the one with liam neeson yeah yeah, yeah it might, it's it, probably yeah. the second movie where they're actually let out of there release the kraken yeah so it's the second <laughs> movie because that's the first movie the kraken okay the first movie. yeah and that's what we're talking about and um so that's what that's what peter and jude are referring to as the pre-flood lockup of the pre the pre-flood antediluvian watchers that committed the original sin of the Nephilim thing. Those right. guys were locked up. And you find this in the book of Enoch that kind of expands on that. And uh, you know, they're lo- they're actually locked up for 70 generations, which is a whole nother topic. But um when when you're talking about the post flood, I think that that that's a different story. These we're in my mind, we're dealing with the Olympians, not the Titans. It's the Olympians who were somehow uh, put see. over the nations of the world. Because Titan Titans are gone. At least for, I see. for a while. I see. <laughs> okay, so the pre-flood guys, they're the ones who created the demonic hybrid offspring, Nephilim, and and they got punished severely right. for it, locked up in Tartarus. Um, and then uh and then it's you have a, a different group, still fallen angels, but a little bit more hinged, guys who at least at least had the good sense not to try to corrupt the messianic line by you know marrying human wives and those guys are the ones who are appointed at babel over 70 right okay and then those get well if that's the case then it's possible we don't know you know but it's possible that those guys might still be in some level of operation today yeah i have a do you know who brian gadawa is no so brian is a hollywood um film writer He's written a couple of movies, but good reformed guy, 
he's a he's a partial preterist takes 70 AD fall of Jerusalem really seriously. He he takes the view that the watchers were kind of done in 70 AD, that that was actually a judgment upon them. So mm. I can't say definitively that they're gone. My view is that, or that they're, that they're not gone or that they are gone. My view is that they're, that they, that he's wrong about that, that it was kind of an already not yet judgment um, for them at, and I think 70 AD probably had something to do with a lessening of their power. But I yeah. think Pentecost had much more of a lessening of their power than 70 AD did. Right. And clearly between 30 AD and 70 AD, the, these watchers, these powers, principalities, thrones, dominions, all these words that Paul throws around that we didn't even know what we're like, what is this? You know, well, that's, that's what this is. And it's very clear that they're, that they're around, at least in those 40 years. And my, my view is that they are still around and that what has happened, and this is my all millennialist, all millennialism coming out, but I believe that, that the power of Satan to deceive the nations is really what the binding of Satan is all about in Revelation 20. So in other words, they're not in the full force of their power that they were prior to the cross and the resurrection mm -hmm. and the, and Pentecost but they still do have power. And so I can say, I have a way of, of understanding that Satan can prowl around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy at the same time that I can say that he's bound because I don't view that bound as an absolute binding like a premillennialist would. Right. I view it as, as a very specific kind of binding so that God, if he wants to save his elect out of any nation, uh, he can do that without them having to become Israelites, be circumcised, move down to, to the line of Canaan right. and all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. He's on a leash and he was always on a leash in the sense that, you know, the, the Satan, you know, uh, is be with the sons of God is before the throne of God, Job, you know, and, and even then he has to ask, you know, permission and, and God sets very clear boundaries. You can do this and that. And then, you know, he comes back. All right. Round two, you can hurt, you know, pound for pound, flesh for flesh. You can hurt his flesh, but you can't take his life. So Satan has always been on a leash because every created creature, um, ultimately because God is sovereign, God is the only being in the universe uh, that has what we would call, you know, autonomous libertarian freedom. Uh, we have, you know, creatures have a degree of freedom, but God is the only one who is truly autonomously free. And so Satan always was on a leash is my, this is my view. It was always on a leash and Job, you know, shows us that. Um, but in the cross and resurrection, uh, it's like Christ, you know, who's always been holding that leash, wrapped it around his head yeah. <laughs> and pulled him in a bit. Like, so the leash got shorter. Yeah, so he's, that's exactly he, right. he's still not thrown into the lake of fire. That will come later. Um, uh, so Satan's still prowling around, uh, but he was, he had, he had more walking around room. You know, he had, he had a little more slack in the leash, uh, pre-Christ, but I, you know, I would put, for me, I would put most of, um, the, the happenings of, of Christ, uh, uh binding Satan, you know, the strong man like Christ even gives that parable, you know, you're going to plunder the house. And I think that's what we're doing. That's the new Testament church. Yeah. Um, I, for 2000 years has been plundering the yeah, house exactly. of this world, mm -hmm. um, th through conversion and gospel preaching. And, and I think even beyond just conversion and the great commission in that regard, but teaching the nations mm -hmm. to obey all of Christ's commands in, in markets and in, uh, art and in governments mm -hmm. and in all these different things. And through righteous legislation, this is kind of, um, all, all of that has been happening because the strong man has been bound and now, you know, we're going in and plundering the house and with a strong man, I think, you know, a certain bind, I think that implies uh, some of, you know, Satan's min minions also being in various in degrees bound. Yeah. Um, and then for me, 80, 70, I, I don't, I don't, I've never thought of it before. I'd have to give it more thought, but I've never thought of uh, demonic binding in 8070. I've always put that on like cross and resurrection. Right. Um, and then, and then 8070, I put that as, as a post mill guy, I put that as the fulfillment of Christ's prophecy, you know, Matthew 24, all of that discourse, this generation will not pass right, away, right, not just right. this type of generation, but, you know, 40 years, a generation in Jewish terms, like you guys, some of you will fall asleep, but a lot of you are going to be awake. And, um, this is the generation that rejected me that, re you know, I came to my own, but they knew me not. Um, you said, you know, crucify him. May his, may his blood be on us and our children. And so, uh, before your eyes and your children's eyes, I'm, I'm going to come back and come in on the clouds, Joel two clouds signifying, you know, yep. a, a sense of judgment. And, and Josephus even has, you know, multiple, um, yep. <laughs> eye, eyewitness accounts of seeing like, you know, 
like silhouettes of chariots going yep. back in the billows of smoke in 87. So that's, that's, I, I think 8070 was this, the wrapping up of a garment that the interim 40 year period between, you know, uh, the work of Christ and, but then now the old covenant is really rolled up and completely yeah. done and gone away. Yeah. And, I agree um, with that. Yeah. That's, that's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. But I think the binding of the demonic powers, a lot of that, May, I, maybe 87, I just, but I don't know what about the, the sacking of the temple in Jerusalem. Yeah, I, th I think he's getting that would, really would from uh, the demons. He's getting that probably from like Gentry's view of Revelation, who's going to come out one of these decades with his magnum opus on Revelation, his commentary that's supposed to be so good from a post mill view. Yeah, that, I've, you I've know, heard the tales. Yeah, I know. We Everybody keeps hearing him. Um, but it's the idea that when you take that early writing date of revelation being prior to 70 AD, then now all of a sudden it allows you to be able to see that almost all of the book has been fulfilled. And so if you do that, then you kind of have to start going, well, did 70 AD do something to, to these watchers? Because you're, you're, you're reading revelation different than like a, a futurist, you know, right. would do so. Or yeah. Historist or futurist. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, and, and I mean, and I do, yeah, I date, Revelation, I think it's, you know, was written moments before 80, 70. I think, you know, these seem things soon to come to pass. 80, 80, I would put it 80, 65 to 80, 69, you know, some, something right in there. But, um, but it's painted even the way that I read other books of the Bible now, like, you know, r like Romans, you know, and, um, and some of the things that Paul talks about, you know, with, uh, future revival of Israel not being in their future, but perhaps in our past. And that's all, that's a whole nother conversation. But anyway, so back to the, you know, seven, so 70 regions and 70 honchos, and they could each have dozens or hundreds or thousands of minions under them. And for what, for what purpose God is, so God assigns them. It's as, it's as punishment. It's, it's a, pu it's punitive. If, essentially. Okay. Explain. So that. there's, there's several different, passages in deuteronomy that talk about this there's one in deuteronomy 4 one in deuteronomy 17 one in chapter 29 and then the one in chapter 32 that basically talks about some of them talk about how i gave them to you and then some of them talk about how basically i gave you to them <laughs> and why mm -hmm. well it's because you you got it essentially it's you you, you wanted deserve each, each other, other so bad <laughs> i'm gonna let you just have each other and see how well that goes for you Okay. All right. Okay. So, so it's punitive, like babysitting, like you're, you're stuck with these people. Yeah. I mean, if Adam was originally given dominion, um, and then he, I think what happens is he abdicates that dominion again. I don't know. I don't know how it worked prior to the flood, but however, however it feel, comes to fulfillment, it's called an inheritance for the sons of God. So somehow they're actually inheriting because they're sons, sons are inheriting things from their fathers. And so this becomes the inheritance. And my, I actually, I think that the reason why God ultimately does this, it's not just purely punitive. That's the myopic view or the view of just why does he do it for in relation to the people or these fallen entities? That's punitive. But there's a much bigger storyline that's going on. If you, uh, if you read the very next verse, it says, but the Lord's portion is his people and Jacob is his allotted inheritance. Now, this is a really mm. crazy verse because, because it, it uses um, the word Yahweh. Yahweh's portion is his people, but it's his allotment. Mm. And so there has to be a distinguishing a mark between the most high in verse 8 and Yahweh in verse nine. And my hmm. understanding of it is that the most high, to put it in Trinitarian terms, is the father who's giving this inheritance to his sons. And the Lord, the Yahweh in this particular verse has to be the son who is inheriting Israel as his allotment. And what's so hmm. interesting, of course, is that, is that Israel's not actually among the 70 nations at the Tower of Babel, God creates them out of nothing. Many, right. many, you know, even centuries later. Because the whole hmm. point of this is that, is that the Son of God is going to, at first, get this miraculous nation that, that God creates out of nothing. Um, it's, gonna, it's going to come through the promise of 
the impossible promise of the of the seed of Isaac through um, the natural birth that comes from a woman who can't give birth and a man who's almost a hundred years old. Right. Right. And then, and then the promise then expands so that you come to Psalm two, for example, this is really kind of the way I just, I, I give people kind of a, a three passage rundown of, of really the worldview. The first one is verse nine, that the, that the son is inheriting Israel. Then if you go to this, one of the most famous passages in the old Testament about Christ, Psalm two, seven and eight, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Okay. So here we have more father, son stuff. Today I have begotten you ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth, your possession. Okay. So now the promise has been given that it's not just going to stop with Israel. I'm going to give it to, I'm going to give you all the nations. And then you go to the great divine council, um, Psalm, Psalm 82, that starts off, God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods he holds judgment. Next few verses are about how they judged wickedly. Um, then he says, I'm going to punish you. You're going to die like men. And then the last verse, arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Who's the God of that verse? It has to be the Son. Because that's what the mm -hmm. promise was in Psalm 2. And so the New Testament comes into this, and it takes it takes all of this predictive language of the Son of God now becoming, you know, and Daniel 7 gets fit into that. I'm going to give you the kingdoms of the world and all this kind of stuff. And then what happens, you know, when Jesus rises from the dead and his, his very last words to his disciples, like in Matthew uh, 28, uh, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now go and make disciples of all nations. What's going on there is that Jesus is now receiving his inheritance and it's up to the church to kind of start bringing the people in. Mm. But the whole point of this worldview is that it's not an end to itself. It's that Jesus is the focal point of the, of the whole thing. So, uh, you know, you brought up Michael earlier in, in our book on the angel of the Lord, Matt and I disagreed on this. And we still do, although I'm I'm moving him more in my direction. But I, I I believe that Michael is the angel of the Lord because he's called Israel's prince. And unless Israel has two princes over him, which is theoretically possible because Plato said that they had two, um, but it's not it's not what I ordinarily think. If Michael is Israel's prince, then he would be the angel of the Lord. And um that fits totally with this okay. worldview. Okay. Hmm. And so you don't you don't hold to the Christophany, which is you know the view that I'm familiar with that like the angel of the Lord. You know, so the, like three angels appearing to Abraham, one of them being the angel of the Lord. That one is Christ pre incarnate. No, I do I do believe that it's Christ pre incarnate. Yes, but I believe that he's the angel of the Lord, and that that's the same that's the same second person of the Trinity. That who is? The angel of the Lord. That the angel of the Lord is the second person of the yeah. Trinity, Jesus. Yeah. But then yeah. what, where does Michael come into play? He, he That's a proper name for him. He's just a different name. So if, oh. just like angel of the Lord or Lord Yahweh or name or glory or right hand um, or, uh, you know, word, <laughs> the word of God in John right. 1, 1. In These the are all just the different Lord. ways of speaking about who this person is. And I think Michael's the same way. It's a proper name. Who is like God? That's all that it is. And the answer is so no why, one is like God. Right. But why Michael? That I mean, that's that's the only thing. I'm following you until that. Like, why why would Michael be a proper name for the second member of the Trinity? You know, like, I, why not just call him Yeshua, as he's been called? You know, or like, I, I've just always imagined Michael as, because I mean, frankly, it sounds it like it gets a little close to what what is it, uh, Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness, where they you know <laughs> they believe that Jesus is the Archangel Michael, you know, and that he's a created being and that he's not actually a member right, of the Trinity. Right. Yeah. So I, I I think that the Jehovah's Witnesses are they're right and they're wrong. The Jehovah's Witnesses, in my view, are right that Jesus and Michael are the same thing, but they're wrong because they make Jesus a created being. Right. And he's not a created being. So why would they use the phrase? I think it, there's some early antecedents to this. 
then probably the biggest one is in Exodus 15. This is the other song of Moses. And uh, early in the song, you know, he's celebrating the Egyptian and the Pharaoh being thrown into the sea. And in verse three, he says, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And then in verse 11, he says, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? This is not um, this is not a passage that's talking about God in his in his oneness, his 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 bare essence. And it's not talking about the father. It's talking about the son, the, the Lord, who is a man of war, the commander of the armies of the Lord, the one who Joshua saw when he fell down on his knees. And and and, and the commander said, take off your sandals because the place where you're standing is holy ground. Well, that comes straight out of burning bush story where Moses was told the very same thing by guess who the angel of the Lord. So when it says who is like you among the gods, it's a, all Michael is, is a play on that, on those three wo English words. That's all it is. Hmm. Okay. I've never heard that before. Yeah. It's interesting. In a world where giants like Google and Microsoft reign supreme, there emerges a new challenger, a beacon of hope in the digital landscape, introducing PaxMail, the email company that's rewriting the rules of the game. Say goodbye to data mining and intrusive ads because at PaxMail, your privacy is our top priority. But that's just the beginning. With our docs and drive features, you'll experience seamless collaboration like never before. Whether you're working solo or with a team, PaxMail has got you covered. And here's the kicker. All the founders are Christian abortion abolitionists through and through. Our commitment to fostering a digital environment that respects all life is unwavering. That means no algorithms pushing harmful content, no tracking your every move, just a clean, based space for you to thrive. PaxMail, empowering you to take back control of your digital life. Sign up today at PaxMail.cc and experience the difference. Again, that's PaxMail.cc. Sign up today. All right, so to back up, so you're saying post-flood, Tower of Babel, 70 different, you know, regions, principalities, and 70 maybe chief fallen angels, all their minions over each of these regions. But then the Lord Jesus, second member of the Trinity, also referred to as Michael, but not the way that Jehovah's Witnesses right, would say correct, it. He is, he is eternal, uh, sharing in the one triune The one who essence. created these guys, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um and to him was a portion, not one of these 70 regions. Right. But his portion came later, centuries later, but he was going to get a nation as well. And as the only begotten son, the favored son of, of the father, mm -hmm. he gets the best inheritance. It starts off small like a mustard seed mm -hmm. with Abraham, but grows into this tree that ends up filling the whole earth. And, and finds its ultimate fulfillment, not just in the, the nation of Israel, but in the church, and becomes an all-earth-encompassing tree that gives shade to the beast and rest to the birds. And is that, babe, that's what you're saying? That's, that's the storyline of the, that's one of the main storylines of the Old Testament, yep. That's pretty cool. It is All pretty right. cool. All right. So the last thing, because you wrote a book on giants. I feel like we got to get there a little bit. You know, we, we've already <laughs> taken some time, but... What, how, do, how do giants come into play and, and what's their rel relevance? And is there, is there a sense in which we can say Jesus is, uh, among many things, a giant slayer? He's Jack, climbs the beanstalk, right. kills the, you know, like. Right. So he, uh, it, when I wrote the book, I wanted to, I wanted to make a book that was n not going to focus on the second coming. Uh, cause there were already a few sensational books out there and it's really the dispensationalists who are, have written those books right. and they've really capitalized on the whole Nephilim thing the last, I suppose, 10 years or so it's become big in those circles. And, uh, I wanted to write this as a reformed guy trying to ref do a biblical theology of the giants and I wanted to end it at the first coming. So that's what I did with the first edition is I ended at the first coming and the way I did that was I took the, again, the universal view of the early church with regard to what an evil spirit is. 
So an unclean spirit uh, or an evil spirit in the New Testament, these are unclean because just like other things that are unclean, the mixing of different fabrics or, you know, those kinds of kinds of laws in Leviticus, that's what a Nephilim was. It was a mixture of heaven and earth. It was by definition unclean. Mm. And so I have a, I, th I think I have a, I think, I think I have an appendix, or at least I have some quotes in the book about this, that it was the universal understanding of the church fathers that when a, when a, a Nephilim or a Rephaim, whatever you want to call it, and when it died, because it didn't belong to heaven or earth, it became a spirit that roamed the air, and those spirits became the demons of the New Testament. So mm -hmm. when Jesus is casting out demons, confronting demons, doing anything at all with demons. He's literally continuing the battle that Moses fought against um, Amalek, that Joshua fought against, um, you know, the sons of Anak, that David fought against Goliath. Believe it or not, that Esther and Mordecai fought against Haman, because if you look at the names and you look at the genealogy of Haman, he comes from the lineage of the Rephaim. Hmm. He's wow. he's carrying out this storyline that is predicted all the way back in Genesis three fifteen that there's going to be this seed war, and he's doing it now because in the New Testament, at least in Israel, you know, we could talk about whether or not there's giants of the places, but in Israel they had been they had all been conquered physically, but now their spirits are still lingering and tormenting and creating havoc like crazy, and so he deals with them, showing his power over them in a way that no other exorcist or anybody like that walking around it could even come close to. And they, they're also yeah. the ones who recognize that he is the Christ. Nobody else does that. It's the right. demons that do it. <laughs> and sometimes he tells them to shut up and not <laughs> right. tell anybody else. Um, so all right, let, let me pick your brain about this. So that's fascinating. Uh, w but with that um, Legion, I think it's Legion. Yeah. Where, uh, is Legion the one that asked to be cast into the, right. the pigs? Right, right. Right. So, and I'm thinking also, I'm going to pair that with something else. So Jesus, you know, he says, um, you know, he, he gives this explanation of what, you know, when a demon is cast out, it goes through arid places, goes through the air, waterless places. Um, and then, you know, and then it's going to circle back eventually, you know, in the house, it can be swept clean and put in order. But if nothing's filled, uh, if the house remains empty, then the demon will come back and bring seven friends worse than itself. And the latter state of the man will be worse than the former. Right. Um, it seems as though these disembodied spirits, um, one, it seems as though they, they would like to be bodied. Right, they would yeah. like to have a host. Yep. Uh -huh. um, because and, they had one before. That's what's right. so important about it. They lost their body. So, uh, so many people confuse fallen angels as if they are demons. Hmm. And that's wrong. It's biblically wrong. And it's historically wrong. And nobody believed that. Uh, angels have their own bodies. They don't seek to embody anybody because they already have a body. Now, right. they can certainly torment or they can insinuate, or they can talk to, or whatever, but they don't possess people in the same way that an evil spirit does. Hmm. Right. So, when Jesus casts, he, he grants this request. He obliges Legion, casts him, uh, you know, this host of demons, many demons, into the pigs, and then the pigs immediately commit suicide. They run... Yeah, into the water, and the, and I've heard different things about that. I've, I've heard theories about well, like, well, the Nephilim were drowned in the flood, you know, and that has yeah. something to do with it, or, um, or they, you know, when they're disembodied, they're cast into waterless places, um, and so yes, they had the body of the pig, but that's not a body of a person, and so they use the pig to get them to the water, so it's not a water. Like what? I, I don't know. What What do you think's going on there? Why did they? <laughs> why did they cause the pigs? Yeah. I do think that there's probably is something to the fact that they were destroyed in the flood. You know, of course, you're assuming that the, that the demon, that Legion was a pre-flood demon giant. He could have been a post-flood giant. So gotcha. That, if there's multiple world. incursions, right, he, could right. have, he could have been someone that Joshua killed. Right. But there's something more going on, which actually with the pigs. So remember, a Jew would never raise pigs. This has to be a Gentile doing this. And it's in the land of Bashan, essentially. And uh, the pagans would offer pigs to the gods um, at their dolmens, which is their grave markers, all around this area. And so there's a whole bunch of weird stuff going on with the very fact that there's pigs. Like, 
what's that all about? Well, it, it's kind of a it's kind of a sacri- it's a sacrificial animal for a pagan um, ritual. And then so it's an it's the whole thing is ironic, really. And it's not a satire, but I would say irony is probably the best word for it. These guys go into the pigs, which is the 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 creature that would be offered to them anyway. But the pigs are alive. Pigs have their own minds and the me- pigs go out of their minds. And I don't think that the plan of the demon was that it would die. I think that was oh, I think okay. that the that the pig itself it went so crazy because think about how mad Legion was, the man who was possessed by him. The pigs right. went nuts. And so then they ironically again jump into the Sea of Galilee, which is called the deep in the in in, in Canaanite literature, and it's a sim it's a symbol of chaos. It's a symbol of the home of Leviathan. Mm. All kinds of weird stuff going on there. And in the same way that like Revelation related. talks about that heaven, there will be no sea. Because yeah, the sea exactly. the sea is symbolic. Like, yes, you know, the, the in the Genesis narrative, the spirit is hovering above the waters, you know, and uh brooding above the waters. And then, you know, but the sea, the earth is without form and, and void and and it's the sea represents chaos. It represents and death, you know, that the sea will give up its debt. You know, it's like it's mm-hmm. Um, and then there's something to be said for, it's not just the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the fact that the physics are being, you know, supernaturally breached, but, um, you know, pointing towards Christ and his deity, but it seems like there's something symbolic to, you know, to Jesus walking on water, tramp, treading on the sea, you know? Oh yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. That's Any a, thoughts that's a on whole that? other discussion. I have lots of thoughts on that. I'm preaching through Luke right now. And I think that when Jesus is on the sea, that uh and you know whether it's calming the storm or or having peter walk on the water or whatever he's doing even even with the pigs jumping into the sea there's always satanic overtones going on because leviathan is the dragon is satan for to think about john 12 and john 20 Mm -hmm. those are all being connected and so when jesus is doing stuff around the sea or on the sea he's showing that he has power over the the creature who lives in the sea which is represented by a leviathan which is therefore represents satan it's an attack directly on satan himself hmm. okay yep uh going going back to the garden real quick um so the you know the serpent um do you so do you think that when when satan is tempting eve um, and it's this, you know, talking serpent, but a serpent with legs, right? Because the curse is that it would then. So I don't, I don't think so. Does. I don't think that's what's going on. Okay. I was, so I was going to ask, is that, it, it seems like Eve is talking to someone that she's maybe seen before. Like yeah. She's not caught off guard, but go yeah. ahead, go, go, go ahead and give me your view. Okay. So, uh, the, when you go to extra testamental literature, Jewish literature, and this is this appears in two or three places. Some of the Dead Sea Scrolls had this. Uh, a book called, I think, The Apocalypse of Abraham has this. When they describe the Watchers, they describe them as serpentine in appearance. So okay. I think that what's happening there is the serpent is actually, it's a, it's more than a metaphor. It's not just a metaphor, uh, but it's a picture of, of evil in some really strange ways. Uh, the word Nahash can mean a serpent as a noun. It can mean a shining one as an adjective. And as a verb, it means divination. Um, Heiser says that the Nahash could be a substantival adjective there so that you could actually translate it as a sh- the shining one spoke to her. And the reason I say that is because if watchers are associated with serpents, but they have humanoid uh, appearance, and I think like I, I think tend to think of in the UFO world like reptilians. I don't know if, that they are the yeah. watchers, but that's a good way of thinking about it. they're humanoid, but they're serpentine. And I, I, I think that that Eve is not talking to us to a possessed serpent or a talking serpent, but she's talking to a watcher. And she wasn't surprised because this is where he belongs, because it's the divine council. They're all over the place. And this is just the one who happens to come up to her to to test her the same way that the Satan does in Job one in that divine council scene, when the sons of God go with the Satan to talk to the Lord about what should they do with Job down on the earth. 
Right. I just, okay. I, I think it's a, it's just much, it's much, uh, it's, th this is not something that should cause people to lose their faith in the Bible because Eve is talking to a talking snake. Right. You, you know, you hear that objection from atheists all the time. No, there's something what, very different going on there. Right. So then what, how would you explain the curse though? of uh, the curse towards the serpent. Yeah, not, not uh, just the that word, kind of language is used all the time. It's used in Isaiah 14. It's used in um, Ezekiel 28. It's used in Obadiah, um, that you will fall from the heights and you go down low as you can go. It's a, it's a way of metaphorically describing that you are at the highest place that there could be, and now you're going you're gonna to run around in the dirt of the earth. Gotcha. Eat the dust. You're gonna eat the dust. Exactly right. We see. Yeah, we have that metaphor in English to this day. Right. Bite the dust. Another mm -hmm. one bites the dust. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Okay. That's very interesting. Um, it's piecing together a lot of different things for for me as I'm just personally looking into some of these some of these different views. And it's I, I it's fast. I mean, it is fascinating. It like it does make sense of so much, um, especially like mythology. And, and it's like, oh man, like like the world really is like there really is a spiritual battle. The world yeah. really is a magical place. And um and and it was I mean, I just can't imagine like you know, I think of like Noah and like uh man, it was it was probably pretty crazy to live I, in the I antediluvian so. world. I mean, you probably like I mean, from my understanding, you've got dinosaurs, right? It's I'm 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 a young, you know, six earth a six day young earth creationist. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't think that you got dinosaurs for millions of years and then man, but so no, like, you know, you've got dinosaurs, you've got uh, giants, you've got fallen angels, you know, that are, have their hand and all these things. Uh -huh, and that are visibly showing themselves. Visibly showing themselves. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to build a boat and God's going to flood the whole world. I mean, that's, that's a crazy time. It is. It would make for a good movie if some crazy guy named Aronofsky didn't already ruin it. Yeah, someone could do it well. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, any any final thoughts you want to leave the listener with? No, not on these topics. I mean, there's we could talk. I could talk about this for forever, really. So, cool. There's no way well, to where we're you just go with it. We're just gonna have to have you back. That's <laughs> that that's fun. the solution. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, how can our listeners find you? Uh, do you want to reference one of your books and where they could buy it if they want to go check it out? Yeah, I mean, uh, you can go to my church web or to, well to my website first douglasvandorn.com and uh, i have all the books linked there and I have a whole bunch of other stuff there too i you know i've done tons of podcasts so those are all linked on there and it's i redid the site um last fall so i think it looks better than it did uh that's where you can go all my books are on amazon so i just do the print on demand through amazon and that's been good to me so nice. far, they haven't they haven't censored me or anything. Yet. So just look up uh, Doug Van Dorn, Amazon. Yeah, on Amazon, and then also uh, people can go to our church website. Uh, it's rbcnc.com. So just the initials for Reform Baptist Church of Northern Colorado, and uh, you can check out our church there. You can see what you know we believe and a very. You know, it's, it's funny, Joel, because as as crazy as I am, our our worship services totally conservative and right. like a Michael Horton kind of a URC sort of a mm -hmm. thing. And, and, uh, people, it kind of freaks some people out because they hear about me from blurry creatures or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they, they go to the, go to the church service and like, well, this is what it wasn't what I thought it was going to be <laughs> like. Right. So, I mean, that's what right. I am. I'm a, I'm a reformed guy. I'm a reformed Baptist. And, right. and, uh, we have all of our, all of our sermons are for free on the website. Most of them are in PDF. So you can download those, do whatever you want. If nice. there's a weird topic, I mean, I've been pre preaching for 22 years. I've gone through a lot of books of the Bible. I don't skip verses. If it's weird and it's there and I've preached on it, chances are that I've talked about this. So it's a great resource for people to be able to dive into on all kinds of these subjects. So Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me on, man. Absolutely. God bless. You too.